The invitation today, we're looking at two Sidonian women, Sidon by Sidon. Anyone? No, no takers? All right. But it's true. There's a difference between them. And it centers around the prophet Elijah. Uh, or rather, I should say, it centers around the account of the prophet Elijah. This is a time when, 1 Kings 17, verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there will be, there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Elijah being the prophet of God and Ahab being the king of Israel. Elijah says, There will be no dew, there will be no rain for years, unless Elijah says so, as God gave to him, of course. And so there's a great famine in Israel because it doesn't rain for years, and things get bad and things get worse, and that's how it goes when you don't have any rain on the land for three years plus. But the question is why? You know, why is there great famine in Israel? Why did the Lord send his prophet Elijah to tell them that the word of the Lord controls the skies and the, you know, the, the rains of the heavens? That's a good question. The first Sidonian woman, woman that we look at is the widow in 1 Kings 17. The, Lord, the word of the Lord, at verse 8, came to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded, commanded a widow there to feed you. So the first thing that happens after this de decree, well, actually, it's not the first thing. But one of the first things that happens is he goes over to Sidon. First, he actually went to hide in a wadi on the other side of the Jordan which eventually dried up, as wadis will do, especially when there's no rain for three years. So the Sidonian woman is where he goes next. And God said, you're going to go, and that's crossing the land of Israel, you know, from the Jordan over to the coast of the Mediterranean where Sidon is. But you're going to go to Zarephath, which is part of Sidon. Why? Because there is a widow there whom I have commanded to feed you. Until this time, he had been feeding him with the ravens, okay, but doesn't matter. The focus is there's a widow in the land of Sidon, not Israel. Sidon is not a tribe of Israel. This is somewhere else, a foreign country. And he did it. He did what God told him to do. He went there. And, you know, Elijah, on showing up, gives her some things that she is to do. But he gives a, a blessing to her in the 14th verse. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour will not be spent, the jug of oil will not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and her household ate. Oh, she and he and her household ate for many days. So this woman who was at the point of death who thought that things were over, nonetheless receives the prophet of the Lord, God of Israel. It's well known in the area that the God of Israel is the reason for the famine, by the way, and for the, for the uh, drought. She knew, though, that this man was, in fact, a prophet. She listened to what he said and to the promise that God had for her that they would be sustained, and she went and did as he said which is what we would call faith. She trusted what he said. She trusted God. And in fact, what God said, of course, 
was true. She had a single jar of flour, a single jug of oil, and it never drained. Neither one of them went away the whole time. Until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So the whole time of that famine, they had enough to eat in her house because God sustained them. And something terrible happens, if you're familiar with the account, to her son. Her son passes away, and she's very angry with the prophet and distraught, but that's understandable. Any mother would feel the same way. And she comes to him with her dead son in her arms. You know, he takes her son from her when he begins to ask God for the child's life. And God answers that prayer and brings them back. At the conclusion of this, 1 Kings 17, verse 24, records her reaction. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you really are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. This woman in Sidon, a country that is not known for worshiping the Lord, believed in God enough to let one of God's prophets in to be sustained by the miracle that God gives them and indeed to witness the resurrection of her own son so that you have this Sidon, this woman from Sidon saying, the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. She recognized that Elijah was just a man, but that the word that was being sent by means of that messenger was the word of God. That was truth. She needed that. And she loved that. And she held to it and she obeyed it and it blessed her. It's pretty cool, actually. But if you go back in the 16th chapter, the other Sidonian woman that we look at is Jezebel. It says about Ahab, as if it had been a light thing for Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he did, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built there in the capital of Israel. And Ahab made an Asherah, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And there were some nasty kings before him. But it said in 1631, 1 Kings 1631, she is the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and she clearly is an influence there because Ahab sets up Baal worship, and they're now worshiping Baal in Israel, which is the God of Sidon, not the God of Israel. And you fast, for fast forward to the 18th chapter, we find out that this Sidonian woman, Jezebel, was responsible for a great persecution against the prophets of the Lord God. It's First King, First Kings 18.4, when uh, Elijah appears to one of the king's servants, and the king's servant tells him, or we're told about that servant, that when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, the servant Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So that's interesting. These prophets had a kind of sustenance through the famine, but they were in caves, and they were hunted. And it reminds you of the closing verses of Hebrews 11 about how they wandered about in caves, destitute, of whom the world was not worthy. So Jezebel did this. She's mad at the prophets of the Lord because it's known that the Lord is the reason for the drought. Well, the Lord is not actually the reason for the drought. You know what the reason is? The sins of Israel are the reason for the drought. And this whole thing is about Elijah trying to turn the hearts of the children back to God, to bring them back to say, hey, 
We're not going down Jeroboam, Jeroboam's religion, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and, and falling in with uh, Aaron's golden calves and Korah's priests from every tribe. Nor are we going down the path of Baal and following the gods of Sidon. We are turning back to the Lord. That's the whole point of what Elijah is doing. During that time, Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord. They had to go into hiding. And yes, as Elijah intimates in 1 Kings 18 and 19, the prophets of Baal numbered 450. The prophets of the Asherah numbered 400. And they eat at Jezebel's table. She's feeding them. She's supporting them during a famine when a widow in her home country is ready to die. And Elijah comes to her and she's preserved alive. But that woman is eating twigs and going to die while Jezebel is feeding almost a thousand false prophets inside of Israel. That's two Sidonian women. Now, over in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 4, you have this. The Lord Jesus brought this up. When he said to them, truly I tell you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the prophet, or when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to not one of the widows of Israel, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. The fact that they are Sidonian, well, that's not the issue, you see. Jezebel was Sidonian, and she imposed the religion of Sidon in Israel. But this widow in Sidon fed the Lord's prophet and kept him alive. And the Lord's prophet was sent to her. She's no Israelite. You see... The children of Israel weren't listening to God's prophet. That's why there was a famine. That's why there was a drought. They weren't listening to God's prophet, but this woman had faith, and so he was sent there. And it's what Jesus said in John 7, 24, Do not judge by appearances. Judge with right judgment. This word for appearance is the word for face. It's individuals. You don't judge by who is in court. Judge by what they have done. That's what he means. It isn't about being a Sidonian or being an Israelite. The truth is, when Peter is sent to Romans in Acts 10, he told them plainly, what is between the lines in all of these verses that we have looked at today, which is Acts 10, 34 to 35. Truly I understand God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That God shows no partiality, by the way, the, the language underneath that, um, your King James will say no, he is no respecter of persons. It's that same word, faces. He does not receive faces. It's what Jesus said, don't do in John 7, 24. Don't judge by faces. Judge with right judgment. In Acts 10, God does not judge by faces. In every nation, Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And this is the closing thought, is let the waters of life flow because 
that widow in Sidon, and not to mention her son, lived, even though they were Sidonians, because they feared him and they did what was right, and he accepted them and he blessed them. And when Elijah goes back to Israel, he's bringing news that it's going to rain. And it does. But he's already been making it rain for this widow. If only we would listen to God now. Listen to God today. Let the waters of life flow is the invitation of heaven for you. It's saying, we're saying, you know, the word of God and the work of his Christ is like streams of living water in the desert. Our hearts are that desert that it flows through, and he gives life to whom he will. We are from various nations, and, you know, I don't think any of us claim Israelite heritage. We might, but I, I don't think so. But whatever nation doesn't matter, Acts tells us. What matters is, do you fear God and do you obey God? If so, then let the waters flow. God will bless you. That's what that's about. You will have life. You will drink freely of the waters of life. Are we today speaking and you are not yet a child of God? You are not a Christian. Well, let us help you to become a child of God. Let us encourage you to become a child of God. The call is not ours. The invitation is not from us. It's from God. It's from heaven. But we do encourage you to obey the gospel. We have water here prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. You might be buried, put to, get, put to death the old person resurrected a new person. It's not about where you're from. Um, you know, it's about where you're going. There's two different Sidonian women, and they had two different fates, and they had two different outcomes, and the Lord spoke very highly of one and very lowly of another, if you're familiar with the Revelation. It had to do with whether or not they obeyed God, whether they loved him. Today, are you a Christian? Become a Christian. Today, uh, are you a Christian um, and need the prayers of the saints? We'll be glad to pray with you and for you that you might be restored to him, that you might have the waters of life, the forgiveness of your sins too, the resolve that you need to see it to the end. If you today need the prayers of the saints or you need to be baptized in his name, Please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.